Welcome to the first lightning round video of 2023. How are you guys doing? Before I get to the questions though, um, this might be a good time to do a little bit of house cleaning and just kind of fill you guys in on some of the channel stuff that's going on right now. If you're not interested in any of this, that's perfectly fine. Feel free to jump ahead to the questions. It'll be noted down the timeline or you can just jump to here. So I've been posting every Monday on this channel pretty much since the fall of 2014, which means that I am now in my ninth year of doing this. And just in case you wonder what nine years on YouTube does to a person, this is what I used to look like back then. And uh, this whole Ikea background thing that uh, you guys have gotten used to back here, this actually showed up about a year later, about the, around the end of 2015. And uh, you know, it's changed a little bit over time, different things on the shelves and whatnot. But basically, I've been sitting in front of this whole Brady Bunch thing for about seven years now. It's um, time for a change. So in the next couple of months, I am going to redo all of this. I'm, uh, I'm getting an entirely new setup, new background, new tangent cam, new lighting, new computer, uh, maybe a, a third camera for reasons, but this will be a completely different look. And that's gonna require a lot of downtime. So basically the reason I'm saying all this is because in February and March, I'm gonna be posting a lot less than I, than I normally do. I normally post about five videos a month. I won't be posting two videos a month in February and March, and I'm gonna shoot them ahead of time. Now I know a lot of you don't like change and you're gonna groan a bit, but you'll get used to it. The idea, of course, is to make everything better, right? I mean, a little more professional, a little easier for me to get set up and get recording, higher quality and everything, just everything better. It'll also give me a chance to sort of evolve the channel a little bit as we go forward. Nothing will change dramatically, uh, especially at first, but you know, nine years is a long time to do the same thing, you know? And uh, I wanna be able to keep growing creatively and, and explore new ways of doing what I do and, and give you guys what you want. Of course, I wanna say thanks ahead of time for your patience um, and for giving me the opportunity to be more creative and do more creative things. You guys have been uh, amazing and supported me on this journey all this time. It means the world to me. So with any luck, all of that will launch around April. I'm gonna take February and March to kind of do all the work. I still got a few videos I need to record to get you know caught up so that I can do that. But that's the plan. That's what's going on right now. I'm excited about it. And I hope you guys are too. And with all of that out of the way, let's get to the lightning round questions. John Regal asked back in December, what are your favorite holiday traditions? Do you guys celebrate an Usmas weekend? Is that the one where the baby Us was born in the manger? Do you celebrate a Friendsgiving? No, friendship is its own reward. Look forward to picking up a tree? Okay, I actually have some, some thoughts on, on that because that 24 hour rerun circuit of It's a Wonderful Life or Christmas Vacation? Um, okay, well, okay, so yeah, I, I do have three movies that I watch every year and that's Christmas Vacation, A Christmas Story, and Scrooge. Um, Scrooge is my least favorite and I may be falling out of favor. It's basically just Bill Murray screaming every line in the movie. Have you ever noticed that? Anyway, back to the tree thing because I do have some, some thoughts on that. I actually did a TikTok about this, and yes, I do have a TikTok account. Go follow me if that's your thing. If it's not your thing, well, uh, by all means, please, we all want to hear about it in the comments. But here's what I said. This is a fake tree, and I'm kind of fine with that. And basically, I went on to talk about how um, when I was growing up, we had fake trees. Like, I've never had a real tree in my whole life, seriously. And whenever I say that, People always act like, how can you even say you're celebrating Christmas if you don't have a real tree? How can you look yourself in the mirror? That's an abomination against God. Basically, people act like um, it's not a real tradition. It's like a fake Christmas if you use a fake tree. But my reaction to that is it's exactly the opposite because when I was growing up, you know, that was part of our Christmas tradition was getting out the tree and putting it together and then hanging all the stuff on it. That was like part of the whole tradition. And, and I always felt like it was weird and maybe even anti-tradition to go out and get a new tree each year. Like, because we had, we had a tree, we had our family tree that we brought out every year. That was our tree. And that was like a, a treasured tradition for me when I was a kid. And the idea of going out and getting a different tree every year I don't know, it just seems weird to me, it seems wasteful. Not to mention the sustainability issues, you're going out and buying a dead tree and chopping it up and uh, anyway. But the main point of that is just that, you know, traditions are what you make of them, you know? If it's a real tree, if it's a fake tree, I can, I can totally see that if the tradition each year is going out to a Christmas lot and haggling for a tree or whatever, that's part of it. I get that, it's just, the other thing can be just as valid of a tradition too. It, it is what it is, you know? 
Cole Parker asked, if the SLS Block 1B requires a new $2 billion mega rolling launch pad and the Orion vehicle is the only crew rated moon vehicle available, has anyone thought to put an Orion inside a Starship size fairing and launch it on the Starship booster? What kind of engineering and NASA approvals would that require? Does the whole rocket need to be crew rated or just the capsule and abort tower? So from what I was able to find, it looks like in order to crew rate a vehicle, it has to have a failure rate of less than one in 500. And from what I can tell, that applies to both the crew vehicle and the booster that takes it to orbit. Like for example, SpaceX had to get both the Crew Dragon and the Falcon 9 crew rated for the commercial crew program. And ULA had to make modifications to their Delta IV and Atlas V rockets for Starliner. Um, the Vulcan Centaur, same thing, it had to be crew rated as well. So yeah, to my understanding, um, to answer your question about just putting Orion on a Starship size fairing and launching it on the Starship, uh, or the Super Heavy anyway, uh, it looks like they would need to crew rate the Super Heavy. And that's gonna take some time, but um, obviously the goal for the Starship is to be crew rated, so I'm sure that they're you know working on that. But here's the crazy bit. You wouldn't need a Starship size fairing for Orion. You could just put it on a Starship. Orion's diameter is 16.5 feet or 5.03 meters. Starship's diameter is 29.5 feet or nine meters in diameter. Plenty of room for Orion and the European service module and maybe even some other large payload like your mom, casserole, because she's a lovely lady and deserves your respect. Hashtag wholesome. So yeah, if we absolutely had to for budgetary reasons, we could launch Orion uncrewed on a Starship and then launch the crew on a crew rated Dragon dock and transport them into the Orion in orbit, and then just, you know, go to the moon from there. All of that would be less expensive than an SLS launch. Only thing is you would still need the boost for translunar injection, which right now requires the interim cryogenic propulsion stage, which I don't think would actually fit on the Starship, so you might need a third launch to provide that. Or, I guess you could just use the Starship and boost it out from there, but then it would need to be crew rated. There's some kinks to work out in this plan, but the point is, when it comes down to it, getting the Starship operational and crew rated, even just the super heavy booster would be a game changer. So as of right now, as I'm recording this, the Starship is fully stacked on the orbital launch pad with ship 24 and booster seven. 24 seven, that's, that's interesting. Anyway, these are supposed to be the ones that do the first orbital flight. Hopefully we'll see that in the next couple of months. We'll see. On a personal note, I still have some concerns about um, about the Raptor engine and, and the whole Methalox configuration. I feel like the whole system has been a lot more tricky than we all thought it would be. Um, I think Blue Origin's having a similar problem with their BE-4s, that's also Methalox. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to see something go up again. It's been too long. So if you have any genius ideas about how we can incorporate Orion into the Starship design, chime in in the comments, that should be fun. Claudio Souza asked, what do people think about this? Are we approaching the unified theory before anybody could predict? Claudio linked to an article from Quantum Magazine, which has a video in it, I'll, I'll, I'll link it here, but uh, it's worth watching, so, so go check it out. This might need to be a video all its own, though, because this is, this is bananas. You just, you just had to do it, didn't you, Nick? So ironically, this kind of actually piggybacks off of last week's video that I was talking about uh, quantum entanglement. So if you haven't seen that one, there's some context there, so go, go check it out. Okay, if you did see that one, you might remember how back in 1935, uh, Einstein published a paper along with Boris Podolsky and Nathan Rosen that was about quantum entanglement and spooky action at a distance. It came to be known as the EPR paradox. And this sort of illustrated the difference between the quantum world that's defined by probabilities and the relativistic world that's defined by gravity. And really ever since then, physicists have been trying to find a common link between those two types of physics, or quantum gravity, as it's come to be called. Well, it turns out that very same year, Einstein also published a paper with Rosen about black holes. And in that, they theorized that two black holes could be connected by a wormhole, or as they called it, an Einstein-Rosen bridge. This became known as ER, for Einstein-Rosen, uh, and it basically predicted the occurrence of wormholes as a sort of a, a natural artifact of general relativity. And these two papers that came out that same year um, had nothing to do with each other. You know, one was about quantum mechanics, the other one was about general relativity. And Never the twain shall meet. Until 2013, when the twain shan't met. Shan't meeted. Something happened. Two physicists, Leonard Susskind and Juan Maldacena of Warp Drive fame, uh, they published a paper that became known as the ER equals EPR conjecture, which suggested that those two papers from 1935 that had nothing to do with each other were actually describing the same thing. Basically, the, the wormhole connection described in ER and the entanglement connection described in EPR 
were two manifestations of the same phenomenon. With me still? Let's go. Okay, well, long story short, a team of scientists started exploring how to test this using a field of study known as holographic duality, which I would explain to you if I understood it. I, I don't. But the guy who kind of cracked the code on this was a guy named Daniel Jafaris, and he theorized that you could take a quantum computer, because it's one of the best controlled environments with uh, entangled bits anyway, and you could create a wormhole in that quantum computer and then blast the wormhole with negative energy. And this negative energy would hold the wormhole open long enough to pass a qubit through the wormhole, thus proving ER equals EPR. The team was made up of Daniel Jafaris, Alexander Slokapa, Maria Spiripulu, and Joseph Lykin. And they brought the proposal to Google to use their Sycamore quantum computer, which is pretty much the most powerful quantum computer in the world. It took a couple of years to get all the experimental protocols down just right, but in January of 2022, just about a year ago, they performed this experiment. And yeah, it worked. They created a tiny wormhole and sent information through it. Now, of course, there's a lot of details that I'm leaving out here. A lot of effort had to go into kind of shrinking down the number of entangled particles that would be needed um, to create the wormhole. They started with over 200 and got it down to seven. Lots of math there. But this not only provides experimental proof of a fundamental scientific concept, it kind of opens up a whole new use for quantum computers. And as quantum computers get bigger and more powerful, um, as more physicists start to kind of expand on this experiment and think of new boundaries to push, this could lead to some crazy new understandings of physics. I mean, maybe next they'll pass an atom through a wormhole and then multiple atoms, and then molecules. Maybe someday your great-great-grandchildren. And even bigger, maybe we'll finally have an understanding of how gravity works at a quantum level. That's super exciting. But yeah, go check out that article in the description to learn more. Um, it's a lot of it's way over my head, but it's, it, I don't know, it's, it's really interesting stuff. Brian Beswick asked, yay science. And then he linked to an article about a splashless urinal, but you know, I kinda, I need these to be in the form of a question. So let me, let me help you out. Let me make this into a question for you. Brian Beswick asked, Joe, I have an extreme case of Pyrenees disease and it causes my urine to splash whenever I use a urinal. Like it splashes all over me. I literally leave the bathroom soaked head to toe in pee. Is there a way to make a splashless urinal? Oh, Brian. I'm, so, I'm sorry to hear that. That sounds terrible. But so brave of you to come forward with that, especially in a, a public place where, you know, literally hundreds of thousands of people will know about it. But um, well, thank you for your question. And may God have mercy on your soul. Well, luckily for you and for all of us, some scientists have created what they believe to be a completely splashless urinal as you already know, because you sent me the link. It was presented back in November at the 75th Annual American Physical Society's Division of Fluid Dynamics meeting in Indianapolis in a session titled Drops, Impact, Bouncing, Wetting, and Spreading 4, which is the sequel that answered all the questions left over from Drops, Impact, Bouncing, Wetting, and Spreading 1 through 3, available on Pornhub. Presented by Kavish and Atharaja and his team at the University of Waterloo. Waterloo, water, loo. You ever get the feeling the universe is pranking you? According to their abstract, quote, we found that when a liquid jet or droplet train impacts a rigid surface below a certain critical impinging angle, almost no splatter is generated. Thus, a surface designed to always intersect the urine stream equal or smaller to the critical angle prevents splashback. And their design looks like this. It's the, the second one from the right. The one with all the angles and stuff. They say this was inspired by a Nautilus shells, which, uh, I mean, I, I don't see it. <laughs> I don't know any Nautiluses that look like that. Maybe it has something to do with the inter interior angle of a Nautilus shell, I don't know. But in all seriousness though, it's not just about keeping droplets from splashing back on our clothes. There's also a sustainability angle to it as well. Angle, yeah. According to the abstract, quote, our new urinal designs will keep bathrooms cleaner and reduce the labor, water, and chemicals required for periodic cleaning to promote more sustainable bathroom maintenance. And the length of the urinals will provide plenty of room for high schoolers to scribble some killer limericks on there. All of this, of course, will deal a major blow to the urinal screen industry, so look out, Kavishan. You might come under attack by big foam. 25% of my audience has no idea what I'm talking about. Something else you might want to do in the bathroom is shave, and if you want your shaving experience to be as innovative as your urinal experience, well, you might want to check out Henson Shaving. Henson's been an awesome supporter of this channel for a while now, and I'm happy to promote them because these guys are just a win-win-win from start to finish. First of all, these razors are made in the same shop as machines that do aerospace equipment. These machines have made parts that are now on Mars. 
And they put that same level of precision into their razors, which support the blade all the way across to a depth of 27 microns at a perfect 30 degree angle. This means less chance of the razor skipping or jumping against the skin. This is what they call chatter. And this is what leads to irritation and razor burn and all that kind of stuff. And every piece of it is recyclable. The blades are recyclable. No more expensive plastic cartridges that'll be digging out of the ground 10,000 years from now. And it costs less. Um, over time, you know, the razor is a bit of an investment, but once you buy it once, the blades are only 10 cents each, so you save more, more money in the long run. There's actually a chart that they have right here that shows how it works. Actually, you can get those blades for straight up nothing. If you enter the promo code Joe Scott at checkout, you'll get this 100 blade pack for free. You won't spend another dime on shaving for like a year. Actually, more than a year. It was probably like closer to two years that this will last. Anyway, just make sure that you add the razor pack to the cart. They'll subtract the price at checkout. So yeah, better shave, less money, more sustainable, supports an awesome company, and it supports this channel. Like I said, wins all around. So yeah, if you've never tried out a safety razor before, it's worth a shot. Um, I like it. I think it's really cool. I think it's like how, how Frank Sinatra would have shaved, but, but high tech, high tech Frank Sinatra. Anyway, give it a look. HensonShaving.com, promo code Joe Scott. The link's down in the description. So that's it for this episode. Thanks a lot for watching. Um, please do like and share if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, maybe click on this little video because that'll take you to another video that I've done and Google thinks that you'll like it. Or look at any of those over here on the side that have my face on the thumbnail. And if you do enjoy it, I invite you to subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday. T-shirts and merch and stuff available at answerswithjoe.com slash store. There's lots of new stuff happening over there. So go check it out and it helps support the channel and it's cool swag. So do your thing. Until next time, thanks a lot for watching. Go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week. Stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.